Um, he he came on because I guess Matt Damon was going to direct it and, and asked him to write something for him, and then he, he wrote something for Matt, and Matt didn't want to do it, and uh, and then uh, so Kenny decided he would do it, and then he asked me to do it, which is kind of um, a sh very short story considering <laughs> most movies are involve 35 different combinations of people before the movie actually gets made. Uh, or maybe that's just been my experience. You know, there's always 20 other people who are going to do it, and everyone's very excited, then I'm going to do it. I mean, it's Kenneth Lawner again, so you're going to say yes no matter what, but what attracted you to the role? I had read it and I thought, um, I guess it, the idea of doing something with him was very exciting. I like how he directs because I, um, He's such a good director. He has really good notes and just very helpful to the actors. Um, and the part was incredibly complicated. And I thought that it was, I loved how there was uh, so much emotion in the character, but it, that it was never really, he didn't come right out and talk about it in a way. The closest that he came to is in the scene with the police where he describes what he did. And he's expecting to go to jail for the rest of his life or something. And, they just let him go, and he, he can't bear it. And um, and then from that moment on, he sort of carries that feeling with him, uh, and refuses to forgive himself, and doesn't want anyone to forgive him. Um, which is why that conversation with Michelle Williams at the top of the hill, and they finally run into each other. She's trying to forgive him, and he is desperately does not want her to forgive him. Um, but he also doesn't want to hurt her feelings, and which is why they keep sort of talking over each other, and they're. He's trying to say, I can't go to lunch with you, I'm sorry, it's not because I'm mad at you, I, you just have to understand, I can't talk to you, and, um, and he doesn't want to hear her say, it's okay, I forgive you. Or, uh, so I thought that was really, that was, uh, seemed like an exciting and difficult and scary part to play, which is why I wanted to do it. And I also loved how um, the relationship between him and uh, me and my nephew, I thought was really interesting because you have a guy who um, is carrying around sort of this wound that he never wants, he never lets it heal. He keeps picking away at it and it's this bleeding wound um, because he thinks that that's what he deserves. He should be in pain the rest of the life. Um, and so the way that he deals with other people is doctors and neighbors and anyone else is to sort of keep them in an arm's length. You know, don't come near me because I, I don't want to, I don't want to talk to you or engage with you at a personal level and deal with my own emotions or have you be nice to me. Um, but uh, the young boy doesn't really obey the way that other people do, the way that other people look, see the look in his eye and they kind of back off. And, um, but this 15-year-old kid who just wants to ride somewhere, he's in a band, he's got a girlfriend, he wants a pizza, he wants shit, and he, like, he never <laughs> takes no for an answer. And it, it's, um, I thought that, was a, that would be something that you could sort of endlessly play in any scene. Is, and uh, um, So there's a lot of different things in the script that I thought, I sort of, A, knew sort of how I wanted to do it, and B, had no idea how to do it, was terrified, and both of those things were really exciting. I'm curious, too, because um, I always hear that when actors take on a character, even if it's a villainous character, they feel they can't judge that character, and they have to love that character. So I'm curious, I mean, did you love Lee, which must be strange, because Lee can't love himself. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, you know, you're, you're fight, sort of fighting at odds with yourself, trying to play this person who you know, won't forgive himself. Um, did you get immersed in that? Um, I always understood him, and I and I feel like I don't think of him as a villain in any way. Definitely not. Um, he seemed to me to be someone who was actually a, a, a wonderful caretaker and a very responsible person. Even when he talks to the police, he says his explanation for why he made a fire is like two paragraphs. My wife, or she gets sinuses dry out if I turn the heat on. So. I can't turn the heat on, so and I knew that the kids were going to need diapers in the morning, and so I had to go to the store. So I lit a fire to warm the house. I did this, I did that. It's all about other people. Um, yes, he was drinking that night, and he was doing cocaine, and he was up, uh, and so maybe he forgot to put the thing, the crate, on the front of the fire. Um, but as the police say, it's the kind of thing that a hundred people did that night in that community, and he was the unlucky one. So I didn't think of him as being reckless or thoughtless or any of those things. Um, there are people in the town who 
felt like that one woman who said, I don't want him coming around here anymore. I think he feels that shame. He can, um, and he feels like maybe he deserves that too. Um, but I definitely, I, I love I loved parts of him. I thought he was someone who was disabled emotionally, couldn't deal with, it, it was such a, the wound was so great that he couldn't even begin to address it. So he just kept it there. Um, and you know, he couldn't talk about it, he couldn't work on it, he couldn't do anything. Else. All he could do is focus on the task right in front of him. I'll fix this person's toilet, I'll fix this woman's light bulb, I'll go through my day, I'll show up. You know, when the doctor asks him about his brother, he says, you know, the doctor begins talking to him like a normal human being, she doesn't realize that he isn't quite, and he says, like, I'm so sorry for your loss. And I interrupt him and say, I just, where's my brother? When did he, you know, uh, where's the body? Where do I have to take the body? How do I get the body there? And they're all these very practical, emotionless questions because otherwise he would just fall to pieces. I'm curious, um, because it is so, such intense scenes, and I know you shot long days, was it hard to leave the character at the end of the day, or would you, you know, sometimes go home with that weight on you? Are you, are you able to leave the character? Um, I mean, not in one of those sort of pretentious, like, call me by my character's name kind of thing. <laughs> I don't do that, but I, I feel like you sort of, in, I'm also not quite good enough. I've seen other actors who can kind of turn it on and turn it off. I'm this guy and then I'm myself, and I'm not quite that good, so I have to more or less just sort of be, become as much as I can, be the right personality most of the time. And if you're spending 15 hours a day doing that anyway, you kind of fall into being that person. If I, you know, just pretend for a short while to be like somebody at a party, like hey, I'm gonna be the happy-go-lucky guy at this party, and you know, you sort of end up feeling that way anyway. So it's a certain amount of you just sort of you, know, you absorb it. And so my going home at night was just going home exhausted and trying to eat something and then fall asleep and wake up and go back. There wasn't a lot of time where I had to either be me or be him, you know, I was just sleeping. Um, and, but it was sort of, I think back in that time, and there were a lot of very hard scenes, and, um, and it was sort of like in a fog of depression and sadness for a few months, you know. Uh, um, but it was also really satisfying. I love working really hard, and I don't usually have fun doing movies anyway. I'm kind of like there because I love it, but it's, hard work and, and you're sort of tortured half the time and then it's over and then you feel good about it. No, it was sort of the opposite. It was that it, he wanted to have, <clears throat> sorry, he wanted to have uh, sort of a no, no reaction. The idea of the fire scene was that he shows up with these groceries and it's sort of a surreal vision of his house burning down and, and losing everything. The only thing that he can think to do is sort of hold on. He sort of holds on to his groceries as if like he's just holding on to the one thing that he has. And then from that point forward, it is, um, he's just trying to hold himself together because otherwise it would just sort of puddle into nothing. Um, so he's got two alternatives, he's got two choices. One is to like face his own feelings and his terrible sorrows that he's carrying around, or just completely try to not, not the, look outward. And, um, and the, the beginning, the fire scene is the beginning of that, where he just holds on as much as he can. Um, and so what was hard about it was sort of not responding like a human, you'd think someone might. Um, and people behave in all kinds of ways. So it seemed very, also very natural that someone might just stand there in shock. Um, that, that was a sort of difficult scene in imagining how, playing it so still, non-reactive, but also trying to find the shock in it without sort of broadcasting, oh, I'm upset, I'm upset, you know. Um, I would say the other scenes that were really hard were scenes where, um, they were like just really emotional scenes, like showing up and like, what, I wasn't ready to do the scene this way, but when I showed up and there was Kyle Chandler on the slab, dead. Um, 
Not that I care that much about Kyle Chandler. Uh, <laughs> I'm doing well on him. But I, and I knew that he was alive. Kyle's okay. He's going to be here at lunch. Everything was all right. <laughs> I did have a strong... Uh, I just started crying and I walked in the room. I, because you sort of build yourself up to thinking about what, how to do the scene and what would it be like and your own life and all that. And then I walked in and it was really emotional. Also, the script is so good that I would start the day by just reading as much as the, of the script as I could. Not just the scenes that I was doing, but just, you're just sitting there and drinking your coffee and just read through it all. And it would really be moving every time I read it. So it was helpful. And so when I went to do that scene in the morgue, I just started, uh, uh, you know, I would lend up, hugged him and leaned over and kissed him and, and uh, I, I was crying and, and I wasn't sure that was, I don't think that's what Kenny wanted. I think, I think he wanted to have more of a kind of shock, shock moment. Um, <clears throat> but I couldn't help myself I, and then I couldn't stop and then I had to try to find a way to stop and just reset and do it over. And those scenes are, are, are great. I mean, how many people get to go to work and have a good cry, you know, and then tell people, have people say, like, hey, good job, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Most people have to, like, do their actual job and then go cry in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was hard, hard in the way that it's, it was hard, tricky to get a handle on things. And then there's the crew sitting around going, like, what's the matter with this guy, blubbering in the corner. Um, <laughs> So that was hard. There were a lot of hard scenes, and um, but the, the the script did a lot of the work for us, and it was a great resource to go back to over and over whenever I felt kind of lost. There's a scene where um, Lucas Hedges' character is, is having a panic attack, and it's like the most for anyone who's ever had that horrible experience, it's captured so perfectly that it actually started to give me a panic attack. And, and your response to that is so genuine. I didn't know if you were actually freaking out or that's just great acting. And um, working with someone who is you know, sort of new to this, um, did you learn anything from him making this movie? Um. I'm sure I did, uh, a lot, um, yeah, I don't know, uh, I don't know, I mean, I, I guess I learned like, well first of all I learned how far behind I am, I mean if I had I'd been that mature and self, you know, possessed at his age, I'd be in a far different place in my life, he was really, like, together his mom was on set, but he was like a super pro, and he would take anything you gave him uh, and roll with it. Um, and I was sure it wasn't like that. Uh, so I learned that about myself. And um, <laughs> I, I also learned, you know, that like you can do, uh, that's a pretty hard question. I think I learned that there's a, there are a few scenes in there where I realized how much, you know, he was depending on me to be able to do what he had to do in the scene. And that, you know, Everyone talks about how your actors sort of need the other person, and it really is true. And that was a great reminder of, like, I, you know, he, he was so present in those scenes that he was totally reacting to me. And it wasn't sometimes that he wasn't doing what he had to be doing, it had less to do with sort of Lucas, get your shit together and do it, and like more about Casey, get your shit together so that he can do what he needs to do. And also, you and Michelle Williams have such great chemistry when you see that you other married couple and you really feel the loss of these um, scenes when you're not together. Like, had you met before or worked together before? Because you really do feel like a married couple. Oh, um, that's nice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, um, let's see, I'm trying to think of what you see us do in the movie that makes you think it conjures the image of a married couple. Right. Like, She's giving me a hard time. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. That's America. And then we're, um, and then we're having that moment on the hill. I had, she's so, so extremely talented and good. I'm not really even sure I know Michelle Williams. I really just know this person. I've seen, seen her in a few like Q and A's and stuff like this, and and I thought like, who is this? What act is she putting on here for the crowd? What is this nonsense? And uh, then I was like, oh, that's the real Michelle. The other one was, you know, Randy or whatever. Uh, she was very, had that attitude and that kind of, she was brash and kind of tough. And um, she did a beautiful performance and she totally uh, convinced me of it. Uh, and um, 
I had never worked with her. I was supposed to do a movie called Pete's Drag with Michelle. Uh, <coughs> when this came up, and I called my very dear friend David Lowry and said, I would do anything you do, uh, but it seems like it's just a small part in your movie, and I'm sure there's a million people who do it. And uh, he said, don't say anymore. Are you going to go do Manchester by the Sea? I said, yes. He said, I just read it. You have to do that movie. It's amazing. Go do it. And I guess Michelle was, was going to do it maybe as well. I don't know if that's true or not. But um, we had never worked together. That was as close as it came. And then we did this. I was trying to imagine this Peach Dragon and Manchester by the Sea mashup. I think it's so surreal yeah. to think of you guys in that movie. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, mean, I, I love that filmmaker. I did another movie with him in the summer, and I'm going to do another one. I think David Lowry is terrific. That movie, they're just totally different movies. Well, I actually want to remind everyone, as you well know, because you just saw the movie, that this movie is in limited release right now. Please spread the word um, if you enjoyed it, and it looks like you did. Thank you guys for being a great audience. Thank you so much for being here.